Okay, welcome to the inaugural interview of the Oriental Institute Oral History Project. Today is Tuesday, December 20th, 2016, and we are in Sci Hall at the University of Chicago. I'm Ann Flannery, the incoming museum archivist at the Oriental Institute, and I'm here with my co-host, Foy Scalf, the head of research archives at the Oriental Institute. And we are here with our first guest, John Larson, the head archivist of the Oriental Institute since December 1980, so for the past 36 years. And we are lucky to be interviewing John before he retires on December 30th. John has published widely in both Egyptology and archival studies. And for almost four decades, he has been essential to the Institute and holds a vast amount of institutional knowledge, some of which we hope to access today. <laughs> so thank you for being here, John, and welcome. Thank you. Could you discuss some of your background, just your origin, where you grew up? Well, um, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. My mother was from there. My father uh, went to visit his parents who had transferred uh, to Birmingham during the war, during World War II. Um, my grandfather worked for DuPont and he was an accountant there. Um, my father was in the Philippines during the, the Second World War, and um, but only in, in the last year of the war, during the the the, the rescue of the Philippines, um, and he went to work for Price Waterhouse in San Francisco for about a year, and then he came to visit his parents in Birmingham, um, and. He went to work for Frigidaire Corporation, which was a branch of uh, General Motors at that time. And um, he met my mother, who was working at that time for Frigidaire as well. And they got married eventually. Um, and along came me, and <laughs> then my sister, and then my brother. Um, we moved to... Uh, a suburb of Atlanta, in Georgia, in uh, 1956, and I went to first grade there in Decatur. And then um, the next year we were, were transferred again and we moved to New Orleans where we lived for eight years. Um, and for two years in Memphis and then we moved to Portland, Oregon, which was quite a change for me. Uh, and I only had one year of high school in uh, Beaverton, which was a suburb of Portland. Mm -hmm. um, then, uh, after uh, my senior year of high school, I decided I wanted to be close to where my parents lived. I had been accepted at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, and decided not to go there. Um, I went to Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, which is in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. And um, because I had been to, to three different high schools in, in my young life, I talked to my parents about the possibility of staying all four years at one school, <laughs> and they agreed. And so I was at Willamette until I graduated in 1972. Um, my degree was a Bachelor of Arts in Modern History, um, primarily French and British. Um, my minors were in Art History, which is, which is really the, the pathway to the Oriental Institute for me, and also in uh, in music, there was a college of music at Willamette in those days, and um, I had a heavy concentration in in uh, choral music. Just, um, yeah, we were discussing before how Egyptologists often have sort of an origin story of how they come to the field. We're wondering if if you have one of those as well. Well, I I do, but I didn't realize that I did until. Um, shortly after my mother died, which was in 1993. And we were clearing out her house, and as is often the case with, with children of parents, um, 
there was a lot of my stuff in the house as well as my brothers and sisters. And uh, I found a box of books that, that had been squirreled away in the basement for probably 20 years. Um, and uh, one of the titles was a, was a book that I had been given as a Christmas present by my grandparents um, from the Random House series All About. And there were all about science, all about archaeology. And the book on archaeology was by Ann Terry White. It came out in uh, 1959, so that kind of dates around the time that, that the gift was given to me by my grandparents. And um, in the, the, the book on archaeology, there was a chapter uh, uh, on H Howard Carter and the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, King Tut. Um, and I really kind of think that that was the, the origin story for me. Um, at Willamette, I, my freshman year of college, um, I went to um, register for a course in art history, and all the, the lower division courses for freshmen and sophomores were, were filled up, and only an upper division course in um, ancient art history was available. And the, the professor who was responsible at, at a small school for doing his own registration in those days, um, questioned me closely uh, about my background and whether I uh, had any experience. And I told him, well, at, at Beaverton I had um, had a class in humanities, which I thought was very good. And I hoped that he would take me in the, in the ancient art history class. Well, he did. Um, Professor Cameron Paulin was uh, a character. He was a, he was a curmudgeon. Um, he was about 60 years old at that time. And he taught by the Socratic method, um, which involved asking questions of the, the students in the class in order to see how much the students knew. Um, and I did very well in that course, and, and I took a couple of other classes with him uh, in, in later years. But when I got ready to go to graduate school, I thought, gee, I, I think I would like to go into Egyptology. So he wrote uh, what I believe to be the letter of recommendation <laughs> that, got me, that got me in. Many years later, I discovered that he graduated with a, with a PhD in Far Eastern uh, art history from the University of Chicago, and that he attended the same uh, convocation, the same gra graduate ceremony that Helene Cantor had oh. appeared in. Um, and because they were the only two students in the department, who got degrees that year, I feel strongly that they were probably sitting next to one another. Um, Professor Cantor was, was the, the great um, art history professor of, of my generation of students. And um, both she and Cameron Pollan were in turn students of Henry Frankfurt who taught here at the university uh, from the middle years of World War II up until about 1948-49 when he went to the Warburg Institute at the University of London to be their director. So in a way, through two routes, um, I'm a student of Henry Frankfurt as well. <laughs> um, the, the other story that's, that's strange but true um, is that the view from my college dormitory, um, Belknap Hall, was of the, what would have been the dome of the uh, Oregon State Capitol building in Salem. Um, the, the Capitol building sat on property which had been ceded to the state by, the, by Willamette University. Um, and 
instead of a, of a dome on the Capitol building, the Capitol has a, a huge drum that goes up at, like to support a dome, um, but on top of it is a statue of the Oregon pioneer. That statue of the Oregon pioneer is an enormous thing which is gilded um, and you can't miss it for, for blocks around. <laughs> um, it was sculpted by the American sculptor Ulrich P. Ellerhusen, who also did the tympanum of the Oriental Institute building outside our, our front entrance. So um, in a bizarre kind <laughs> of way, I've got those two connections that, that go back to my college years. Did Professor Pollan encourage you to go to graduate school, or how did you come up with that idea? Um, it was an idea I had on my own, and I asked him if he would write my letter of recommendation, and he agreed. Um, I also had you know, my senior advisor write a letter of recommendation, but I, I, I really feel because of his university connections and that he went back to the Oriental Institute in the days um, around World War II and, and shortly after that the building housed both Near Eastern and far, what became Far Eastern languages and civilizations. So um, it, was, it was kind of interesting. Was, was Chicago the, the only game in town at that point or did you look at other places? Or did you even consider other fields? I, I didn't. Um, Strangely enough, and why I thought I would get into the University of Chicago um, is beyond me. I have no idea why, you know, I was accepted or <laughs> or with the other people who were here, um, but I got in. But you must have been very strong academically, right? I mean, you uh, were coming out of being number one in your class in high school even with all the moving, which is pretty exactly. impressive. Um, so you must have had a fairly strong academic background coming out of your undergrad, I, I, I assume. I did, and it, 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 was, it was kind of varied. Um, I, in, in a way, I, I thwarted my, my senior advisors um, in the history department because by the time I had finished my sophomore year, I would fulfilled the graduation requirements for the history department. <laughs> and so I spent the last two years um, doing choral music and music history and music theory and uh, art history um, and the things that I wanted to do rather than the, the things that I was required to do. And I guess it was the kind of broad general background that, that attracted the, the faculty members here to me as a student, so. Sure, and what was it when you, got, when you got here, what was it like in those times? You know, were you really looking forward to working with anybody in particular or did you sort of get signed an advisor? What was the I, other students I, like? I didn't know anything about the faculty here at that time. The first time I, I stepped foot in the Oriental Institute was the summer before September, October when I started in 1972. So sometime in August, I turned up on a Sunday from, from Arlington Heights um, to, to have a look around to see where I was going to go to school. And it was probably the hottest day of the year. <laughs> and there was no air conditioning in the Oriental Institute at that time. So it was you know <laughs> just dripping <laughs> with perspiration. Um, and I went through the galleries, and they were the, the, the galleries that had been installed to a degree um, by James Henry Breasted himself with some additions and some changes um, by Pierre de Lugas and Helene Cantor as faculty curators. Um, and the, what is now the Mesopotamian Hall was the Egyptian gallery. Mm -hmm. Um, and the Tut statue was in, was in that gallery, uh, along with the, uh, the Lamassu, the, the, the Korsabad winged bull man, who was put into the 
um, end of the gallery simply because they knew when, when the building was under construction that he was going to come to Chicago and they had to leave room and it was the only space available. So they, they put in a temporary wall and then he was let in uh, after having uh, rested in his crates <laughs> under the bandstands at, at Stag Field mm -hmm. for which is which is now the location of Regenstein Library. Mm -hmm. mm. So when you came in, obviously well, probably pretty over overwhelming, but you sort of had um, your generation sort of had a, a direct connection to some of the the very early days of the Oriental Institute, right? I mean, you sort of had maybe one or two generations in between. I mean, NIMS was still around. That, that's Hughes. true. Um, my principal uh, educators at the Oriental Institute were Klaus Baer and Ed Wendy. Um, and as she was coming up and finishing her degree, uh, I was in the first class that Janet Johnson mm -hmm. taught mm -hmm. in probably 1973, I would guess. Sounds about right, yeah. Um, which was demotic. Um, and by and by, uh, there was some, some uh, readjusting of, of faculty members. Um, Ed Wendy was out at Chicago House for a while, and uh, George Hughes stepped in from his retirement and and I had one year of Coptic from, from George. Um, George was a wonderful storyteller, and all we had to do was to get him <laughs> off on telling stories, and the class would be over. We didn't learn a lot of Coptic, I fear. Um, what did you learn? Well, we learned a lot the about the history of the Oriental Institute and about the history of Egyptology, and uh, George was a dear man. He was, he, was, he was very kind and very nice. Um, and uh, Charlie Nims, who was finishing up as field director of the Epigraphic Survey at uh, Chicago House in Luxor, Egypt, um, was uh, added to the mix about 1974. and. Um, we sensed as graduate students that he was sort of between things and, and didn't know what to do with himself. So we got together and persuaded him to teach a, a graduate level course mm -hmm. in the history of the Theban area, which he had done an article on mm -hmm. um, places a, a, around Thebes, places about Thebes. Um, and so we got to know him and and we, we were benefiting from his stories. I, I wish to this day that somehow or other we'd had an oral history project <laughs> like this one that we could have interviewed George and Charlie. Mm. Um, I mean, they started in, in graduate school at the Oriental Institute um, about 1933, 34. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Breasted was still alive and, and active in those days. He, he died in, 19, in December of 1935. So um, they may have gotten to know him. I'm really not sure. Um, when I came to the Oriental Institute as a graduate student, um, there were the two classrooms that were outside the the office space areas of the Oriental Institute. Um, they, 210 and 212, no, 208 and 210. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was the library, which had gone to Regenstein. It, sure, 72, it hadn't reopened yet. Yeah. And um, beyond that, I don't know if there's traces of it still. But the double doors that separate the, the offices on the second floor from the classroom space and the library um, had portiers hung over them. Hmm. There, there, there used to be hooks that you could see that were the remnants of the portiers. 
And the, the, the reason I bring this up is that, that beyond the classroom space was sanctuary. <laughs> um, they, they were the offices of the faculty members. And then at the far uh, end of the hall, beyond, beyond a, a right turn, was the director's study. And the, the legend in those days that was that, that Breasted's office was bigger than the office of the president of the university. Um, and that he was terribly jealous um, <laughs> that, so that Breasted office. had a bigger office and a bigger desk and, and so on. Um, and so I, I get the sense that there was a, a, a discrete separation between the faculty and the student body. Um, the faculty only came out of their offices to use the library and, and it was a couple of years before we had really a working library. Um, the, the history of, of that is, is as follows. Um, the uh, departmental libraries at the University of Chicago were outgrowing their spaces all over campus. And so it was decided to build Joseph Reagan's sign library uh, in order to accommodate the, the, the collections as they were and the growth of the collections. And almost every library, including ours, the Oriental Institute Library, um, had off-site storage. And in, in order to get certain books into the library, they had to send someone from the library staff to the off-site storage to retrieve the book and bring it back. I mean, it was like paging a book at Regenstein, except that it was off-site. Right. And, and I don't know where our off-site storage was, but um, it, was, it was a serious situation. And, and especially in the wintertime, faculty members got really tired of going <laughs> two blocks in the trudging through the snow to check a footnote or exactly. you know to, sure. to, to just do minimal routine sorts of things not to check out a book but to just simply look up something that they that they were puzzled about and then you know return to their their work and it would take an hour out of their time yeah. to go to Regenstein well by 1974, the Oriental Institute had inherited several libraries, uh, William Edgerton's library, Keith Seeley's library, um, and the core of the reconstituted director's library, or, or research archives as it, as it came to be known, um, were Egyptology because of the Egyptologists who had given their libraries to the Institute, and that was how the library came to be. And most of our interaction with faculty members outside the classroom was, was in the library. Certainly. Uh, could you just describe a little bit of how you went from um, graduate student into your position as archivist and the circumstances surrounding hmm. that? And well, I worked part-time for Chuck Van Sicklen, who was the first new librarian in the Oriental Institute. Um, and I believe Dick Settler was, was the other graduate student who was working in the library. So a lot of the early pamphlets and things like that are labeled in our handwritings. <laughs> um, um, and then I finished my coursework after four years, so in 1976, and uh, it, it came time for me to pay back my graduate <laughs> school tuition loans, which were enormous, and not as big as they are now, but, it, but substantial. And so I got a job, um, first of all, working in the cashier's office at at uh, the University Hospital, in Billings Hospital, as it was in those days. And, um, and then after about a year of working part-time in the cashier's office, I went full-time and uh, was offered a job in the oral surgery department as a clinic coordinator, which was essentially the person who um, 
makes appointments and calls up medical records for appointments and things like that. And uh, I worked uh, from 1977 until uh, 1980 uh, okay. in the university hospital system, paying off my loans. Um, <laughs> Then in 1980, the, the first ever Oriental Institute archivist, Ronnie Burbank, um, got a small uh, federal grant from the National Science Foundation for the archives to, to do some, some routine things with, with copying film that had gone bad. Um, and so I applied for that job to, in, in, in the sense of getting me back into the Oriental Institute. And um, unbeknownst to me, um, Ronnie was pregnant at the time. And she, get, she had her baby in December and took her medical leave. Well, I was hired first as acting archivist and then than as regular archivist. So my time as archivist goes back to December of 1980. And um, Ronnie's husband was Canadian. And uh, when he finished his degree, I think in the math department, uh, they went back to Toronto. And mm -hmm. she's been working at the Royal Ontario Museum ever since. <laughs> um, So that's that's how I came how I came to be archivist. Uh, for six months, I was acting archivist, and then then I was appointed regular full time. In um, picturing the past, you sort of, you wrote about the the history of the archive. I was wondering if you could give us a sense of what kind of archive you walked into, in 1980, <laughs> and then also um, going back as far as you can about your understanding of of the Oriental Institute archive and how it evolved. Well. First and foremost, in those days, the, the principal purpose of the archivist was to provide access to outside scholars and to people working in the Oriental Institute to the archive, archival records and principally to the photographic records. And when, when Ronnie took her maternity leave, there were 300 outstanding requests for <laughs> photographic materials and permissions, which had not even been looked at. So the first thing I had to do was straighten out that mess. And, um, you know, as, as sometimes happens, you know, when, when you get back on track, it's too late for the, for the book to appear. And, and, and so, some of the some of the requests were just simply, you know, when I responded to it, it was too late. Mm -hmm. But many of them, there were still time. So so we 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 got back on track. And in those days, we we were working with film and darkroom and uh, uh, developer and and all of that sort of business. So. Um, I worked very closely with our photographer, Jane Grant, uh, on fulfilling the, the requests for photography. And on my own, I did permissions and things like that. The archives at that point were um, in various places throughout the building. Um, the negative collection was stored in my office, which is now occupied by, by Museum Education. Mm -hmm. And I had the annex to that office, which is their meeting room and the, the docent library, um, where lantern, lantern slides were stored and, and a few other things. Um, the photographic collections were stored there. Um, and sometimes I had access to the office adjacent, which is now Nadine Muller's office, because it had a door that, that gave in to, to my office. And I had four desks set up in my office, 
And I early on started taking on volunteers to assist me. And there were times when I had as many as four volunteers and I stood up, um, <laughs> so to speak. Um, then um, there were certain things that were stored in the basement level. There were uh, a good deal of material stored on the balcony overlooking the reading room of the research mm. archives because that space had not yet been turned over to the library for its purposes. Um, it was a few years later that, that I gave up that space and had to, to look for other things. Um, the director's office correspondence, which is now one of the, the principal research uh, things in the Oriental Institute archives, were, were stored in, in cardboard boxes that were stacked about six deep um, in a closet at the top of the third floor <laughs> stairs. And the, the, the weight of the upper boxes was crushing the, the lower boxes. So I had to do something about that. And I initially got file cabinets and then later we, we, we got another system. Um, and then gradually over time, we, I took on the collected papers of Edgerton, which were stored actually in your office, Foy, mm -hmm. um, and uh, a little bit of Keith Seeley and um, uh, Harold Nelson's papers um, and, and Breasted's papers were still in the, the library underneath the, the stairs that go up to the, <laughs> to the balcony. Um, so, uh. <laughs> so gradually I took, I took those over and took those, those in. And as it happens, the early collected papers um, were principally Egyptologists. And because my professional training was in Egyptology, I, I was kind of a natural in those days. In the years since, I suppose that I'm, I'm one of the few Egyptologists that has had as much exposure as I've had to Mesopotamian studies and Achaemenid Persian and, and so on. Um, and so I, I do have now a background which I've learned from doing mm -hmm. in the archives uh, all of the other countries that the Oriental Institute uh, specializes in, mm -hmm. with the exception of Afghanistan, which is a, a, a rather late addition yeah, to the game. Recent. So the archive has grown significantly over the last 36 years. It has, and we've, we've taken in uh, you know, large portions of things. Um, most recently, the card catalog of the CAD, the mm -hmm. Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, and that takes up, um, oh, <laughs> five times nine times four uh, shelves in the, the, uh, in the archive storage room. Mm -hmm. Now, originally the archive storage room um, was on the table as a, as a, a, a dream or a hope. Uh, when the, the new building was, was added to the Oriental Institute around 1995, so it's almost 20 years old now. And um, the space was designed with, uh, with no windows so that we wouldn't have any leaky windows. It was on the second floor so that it wouldn't be under the roof uh, to, to have roof leak problems. The, the only thing is that there is a uh, a, a water sprinkler system, which, mm. and if it ever comes on, we're in deep trouble. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, the height of the ceiling in that space was geared to be even with the with the ceiling of the museum galleries, which is about 16, 18 feet, um, and it wasn't very long after we moved in there. Uh, probably by about 2000 that we began to outgrow that archive space. And I shared the first floor of the new wing with 
organic object storage. So it it has about one third of the space, and the archives has about two thirds of the space. Um, we got a, a, a University of Chicago uh, grant uh, to install compact storage system in there, and so we got as much space as we could from the storage. We, we thought at one time that we would hang a mezzanine in that space mm -hmm. and that the mezzanine would be all archives and would go across uh, organic object storage space. Um, I now think that that probably won't happen, but uh, it's anybody's guess what will happen in the future. Um, the problem with hanging a mezzanine is that we would have to have two sets of lights and two sets of sprinkler system mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it, it just doesn't seem feasible. Mm -hmm. The current configuration of the um, compact storage is that we added uh, an additional cap onto the, the, the usual height of the shelves uh, that's about three feet additional. And so that would have to be removed in order to put a mezzanine in there as well. And we would have to have offsite storage because we've filled up mm -hmm. every space that we have in the building with objects and with, with archives. So um, it could happen. It, we, we might have an, another uh, new wing right. uh, built, but it would it would have to be an, an, ad, an addition, I think, rather than the than the mezzanine as once as once envisioned. <laughs> That's great. Um, so as the space changed, I imagine your job changed as well. So you said it was photographic based, and then with all of these new collections coming in. Well, gradually over time, the the museum secretary's role uh, came to be partly my assistant, and. Um, the museum secretary would do the paperwork that I would sign for permissions to, photo, to, to use photographs and publications and that, that sort of thing. Um, and gradually that has shifted to uh, a photo archives assistant who does all the paperwork, who, who does the, the initial research through the collections, through the IDB, the integrated database, so that before I really am involved in the process, a lot of the work has already been done, and I'm only the, the backup who provides images or scans for things that have not been scanned before. Um, and I spend a great deal more of my time um, assisting visiting scholars with uh, their research and handling research requests that come via the internet and that sort of thing. But in your, your scholarly work has also though influenced projects that you took on in the archives, so transcription projects, your work on James Henry Breasted. Um. We've done a large number of things through volunteers who have, who have transcribed batches of papers in the archives who have proofread and beyond the, the transcription uh, phase of preparing something for publication, um, you've got the handwritten letter, you've got the transcription entering the data into a word processing program, but then you've got the proofreading. And the proofreading is essential because um, you know, nobody's perfect and nobody, <laughs> <laughs> nobody does an, I, an ideal version of the, the transcription and you learn a lot along the way. Um, you learn a lot about things that should be footnoted and, and expanded upon and that sort of thing. So I leave a, a legacy through my volunteers of a large number of manuscripts that can be um, finalized for publication. We did one uh, digital publication through the Oriental Institute Publications Office uh, on the, the breasted um, 
letters home to his family written in 1919 and 1920 on the, the inaugural trip that, that established the Oriental Institute in the Middle East. Um, but there, there's a great deal more than the Breasted Honeymoon letters. There, there, there's the, 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 the Breasted uh, 1905 to 1907 trip up, up the Nile, which could be illustrated from negatives that are in the collection. Uh, there, there's a, a, a lot of stuff. There's the, uh, the Megiddo Field Diaries of Gordon Loud from 1935 to 1939, which, which contain some you know, routine day-to-day things like it rained for two weeks solid and we couldn't do any work, or uh, you know, the, the piano needs tuning, or something <laughs> like that, to honest-to-goodness archaeology records that more and more people are, are going back to and using for... Um, for analyses of the excavations at Megiddo, so um, there's there's that, and there there are several other batches of things. Uh, Korsabad, for example, is another one where we've scanned all the the field negatives of Korsabad, but now we need to to sort of put them together with the the textual record to see what we we might have, and because the Oriental Institute in its final publications of earlier projects like Korsabad, for example, it produced two volumes in the Oriental Institute publication series. But there's, there's a lot more that can be brought to bear, like Gordon Loud's diaries, like letters from the field directors to the director of the Oriental Institute, and that sort of thing some of which contain a great deal of archaeology, archaeological interest. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they really need to be uh, massaged into, into a form that can, be, uh, that can be accessed more readily. Just since you bring it up, I'm, I'm just very curious about the, um, the publication series. I mean, you've obviously put a lot of stuff out on the internet and you've put a lot of stuff out in print, but this OIDA series, the Oriental Institute Digital Archives, um, and we have a lot of stuff I want to talk about in a short amount of time, but um, how much um, was that conceived from the beginning? What was sort of your idea behind that, sort of going forward into the future? Like, what did you really want to do with that? Was it going to be sort of primarily breasted letters, or did you want to do a lot of these other things that you're talking about? Um, a little of both, really. I, b- because... I tried to tailor projects to the skills of my volunteers who were mostly um, mature adult ladies who had retired from from whatever jobs they had had before. So they were, you know, 65 to 70 when they started to working for me. Um, I tried to, 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 to tailor these projects to their interests and to their skills. If, if one lady was interested in, in Megiddo, then I you know, ran with Megiddo. If another was interested in Korsabad, we went with Korsabad. So that's, that's how that happened. Um, the breasted papers as a whole are integral to the origins of the Oriental Institute in its early decades. So that material also is, is uh, very interesting to us. Um, and you know, insofar as we could get that going, it would be pretty interesting to get that uh, in, in line too. Um, what's, what's also interesting to me is the difference between, well, these are issues that, that you two are wrestling with now. Um, born digital is, is something that we live with as a, American and an international world society. And we are going to have to constantly upgrade the programming and the applications and the the storage systems and so on in order to have the archives of the future. The archives of the past is essentially a, a paper record. Um, and that paper record uh, 
will will last as long as the paper lasts. And we've we've done what we can to see to it that that paper is in climate controlled conditions and and stored properly and so on. Um, but the 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 digital age and translating um, that into the future is going to be an interesting problem. I mean, for example, uh, Gil Stein has been director almost as long as Breast had served. Mm -hmm. And um, most of his director's office correspondence mm -hmm. consists of email. Mm -hmm. And so that belongs to the Oriental Institute, it belongs to the archives, but it's still in his hands and it's still, um, it's still presumably in a form that we can, we can access it and do research, but we need to make sure that it stays that way. And all of the other faculty members, their projects and their, their research and their, their files and their um, uh, manuscripts and so on, they're largely all verging into a digital age. Mm -hmm and they need to be maintained and, mm -hmm. and serviced, so to speak. So um, uh, your role will be transitional because you will still be working with, with research involving the early years of the Oriental Institute, but more and more you will undoubtedly be shifting into, into the, the, the realities of the digital age. So you're talking about the future of the archives, what needs to be done. Um, one thing that we're all facing, librarians, archivists, scholars, humanities people in, in general, uh, is a lot of challenges uh, that's on the horizon for us. Funding, space, popular, popular opinion, etc. So we were just kind of wondering with your experience, what do you think are maybe some of the most important actions that the current generation of librarians, archivists, scholars, faculty, students, uh, that they can take to ensure that our fields have a bright future and, and stay relevant? Well, I think um, laying the groundwork for the transfer of digital files to the, to the archives, and by archives at, at that level, I mean the servers that are located either in our building or outside of our building, and we really need to have off-site storage as well as, as in-house storage for that sort of thing. Um, we need to have ready access to, to materials that are, that are born digital, but we also need to have a, a safe place where the, the servers are located that, you know, will, will be safe for, for, for the for the conceivable future. Now, I don't know in terms of time what the future will be. I mean, when we started the discussions with the people in, in the Special Collections Department at Regenstein about archiving things for the future, they, they, were, they were telling me things like, oh, well, the future's five years, <laughs> or, or perpetuity is 10 years, or 15, or. 20. Well, that's not good enough. What's, what's good enough is, you know, is forever or until such time as we're no longer here. <laughs> um, under what circumstances, we could never know. But um, we need to, to lay the groundwork, to, to lay the, the, the parameters and the the policies and the procedures for allowing faculty members and staff members to archive their material in such a way is that it will continue to be um, actively upgraded in terms of hardware and software from time to time and you know in a way, the, the development of digitalization and um, it, it acts against us because th there's, there's, there's a new version of 
Microsoft Word that comes out every three years. There's a new version of this that comes out every five years. There's a new version of that that comes out every 10 years. And on the one hand, that's good because it's good for the economy, it's good for all kinds of things. Um, and it's also good because it, it reduces the amount of storage space necessary and, and expands what you can do, but it makes it harder to, for any one person to, to maintain a control over the, the, the umbrella that, that is, is coming along. Um, I mean, you almost have to have a retention schedule mm. that enables you to say, oh, they're about to come out with a new version of this and the, the following things will be obsolete. What can we do now to, to upgrade the situation so that we don't lose fonts, so that we, so that we, that we, we don't have fonts go wonky on us <laughs> in, in various ways. We, we need to, to get everything converted to a, a standard that will be recognized by the, the, the world of, of digitalization. Um, the other thing is that, that we need to, um, to press our elected officials and the people who make the decisions at the departmental level and at the university level to fund all of these upgrades and, and necessary adjustments along the way. It's not free. It, it comes with a price. And it, it may be easy right now to say, oh, well, we need such and such to throw the papers of James Henry Breasted and to scan the negatives of, of Breasted and his, his followers, but we also need to, to be funding the, the, the gradual development of whatever happens in the digital world. And we need to make sure that our federal funding agencies and our state funding agencies and the, the University of Chicago and the Oriental Institute recognize that need to fund the, the future of the archives or there won't be a future. Yep. Yep. Well, John, thank you so much <laughs> for taking this time. And thank you. We'll definitely have to do it again. Uh, there's so much more Absolutely. to tap into and, and to talk about. So really, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Okay.